all the moms that are here and everything that they have done and put up with. Lord, I pray that they will leave here feeling uh, excited and empowered today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Every Mother's Day, I like to just talk to ladies. Like we're just going to talk to ladies today. But if you've ever wondered what it takes to be a mom, there's some tests we can run. So you want to run some tests? So there's some tests of what it takes to be a mom. The first test will be like a messy test. <laughs> messy test. So picture, um, I don't know, your kid decides to go get a bunch of peanut butter. Next thing you know, you look over and the peanut butter is smeared all over the back of the couch. And for some reason, they drop chicken nuggets behind the couch, too, because for some reason, they're not in the kitchen, they're in the living room, and they sit there for months on end. Well, that, like, that's the messy test of a mom. If you can't handle it, you got to clean it up. Your mom and dads, we know the chicken nuggets are under the couch. We're still watching the game. <laughs> Just the way it goes. The second test is the toy test. If you ever want to know what it likes to be a mom, here's the toy test. Right? You know the big boxes of yellow Legos? You've all seen those, all right? They're horrible. There's like a thousand pieces in them. What you do is blindfold yourself. If you want to be a mom, blindfold yourself. Have your friend of yours take those, spread them all over the house, and then walk through the house from like the living room, said bath, bedroom, to the kitchen and back, blindfolded so you think it's the middle of the night and you can't scream because you can't wake anybody up. If you can do that without screaming, you know you're ready to be a mom. <laughs> here's, or the, here's the grocery store test. You can't bring your kids because you don't have kids yet. So bring a couple goats, because they're both the same, <laughs> okay? And you got to keep them with you. And if they eat anything, destroy anything, grab anything, like you have to buy what they buy, grab what they grab, but they're goats instead. Try to keep a couple goats under control in the grocery store. That's what it's like taking a couple three-year-old boys to the grocery store. If you don't want to do that, you can do the last one. It's the night test. You know those bags of rice that you get? Amy's made them for us, and we love them, but you heat them up and put them on your neck, right? They're like a pound. No, you got to get, like, the bags of rice that are like eight pounds, because that's how much a baby weighs. And then about seven o'clock every night, you got to start rocking this thing back and forth, swaying it, singing to it. So by nine o'clock, maybe it'll finally get, get itself some sleep. And then be prepared to do that as many times every night for the next five years as said bag of rice wants you to do it. <laughs> then you know you're ready to be a mom. Right? That's motherhood in a nutshell. All while, may I mind you, getting up, looking nice, with a smile on your face, pretending you're in the best mood ever to those said kids who are said destroying your life as you speak. That is being a mom. Where do moms come from? Where are moms made from? Moms come from God. Moms come from God. Genesis 1 says this, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and females, he created them. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the sky, and over every living creature that moves on and on or in the ground. God created mankind, which means God created men and women. God created moms. God created moms. He created moms. He created husbands, dads. We all have traits that God has that he gave us. They, our traits, our qualities are from him. God had motherly traits in him, which means that's where you moms get your motherly traits from. That's where we get them from. God didn't make a mistake. It didn't happen that randomly. You have traits from God. So I'm going to look at some traits and qualities that moms have. And honestly, ladies have these too. The first one is this. Moms have intuition. You know how you know it? There's moms already this morning when their kids are running around eating candy and cookies and baked goods this morning. But they looked over at the kid and they just went this. You knew exactly what was going on in your kid's head. And you didn't even have to hear anything that was taking place. You just knew what was taking place in their mind already. It's called mother's intuition. Ladies have this too. Moms is like on a whole new level. And they just have to give a kid a look and you're like, how did you know that? How did you know that? It's called mother's intuition. They're the closest thing to omnipresent 
<laughs> that this earth, natural world has. They are all knowing. They have eyes on the back of their head. They know everything that is taking place. Where does this come from? It comes from Jesus. Look at all these scriptures. Matthew 9, 4. Jesus knew what they were thinking. So why do you have such evil, evil thoughts in your hearts? This is not, this is a mom verse. Right? Kid, I know what you were planning. Why? <laughs> right? Why were you going to do A, B, C, and D? Well, that told me to sometimes. No, that's it. Matthew 12, 25 says, Jesus knew their thoughts. Matthew, or Luke 5, 22 says, when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them. Luke 6, 8 says, but when he knew their thoughts, he said to the man with the weathered, hat, weathered hand, Jesus had a mother's instinct because he created moms. Now, sometimes we think this whole idea that God knows our thoughts is scary, but it's not. Because it's not there to rip us apart. It's not there to condemn us. It's there to be with us. It means he knows what's going on inside of us. He knows the emotional <laughs> and stressful battles that we have. I remember growing up as a kid and growing up in church, hearing these things that like, God knows your every thought. It's like, oh my gosh. It was always in the negative connotation, right? Most of the time, it was because they were trying to convict you about thinking something about a female that you should, right? Like, that's most of the time how church world brought it up. Like, how dare you look at Halle Berry that way? That was how most people brought it up as a teenager or whoever. Like, and that was most of the way how they had it brought up. But I'm telling you, it's not like that all the time. Maybe some of that. But most of the time, it's to know what is going on inside. It is to know the struggle, the pain, the heartache, the thoughts, the stressfulness of going, I know what all my kids are going through. I know what my coworkers and my friends are dealing with. And you, as ladies, so much eternalize all those things so much. And God's going, I know the pain and I know the battle and I know the stress that you are carrying, I know it, and I'm there with you. That's why it's there. He knows. He knows you're hurting. He says, come to me, all who are weary. The second thing about you ladies and moms specifically, you're compassionate. You're compassionate. There's a story in the Bible that does it. It kind of gets talked about. It's kind of crazy. It's kind of not. Some people think it's made up, but it's not. It's in 1 Kings 13. Uh, I think it's like 16 through 28. And I'll just kind of read through it and skim through it. But this story is something that you can't make up, and the story had to be real and genuine. Otherwise, it wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't be sincere. Right? Sometimes I think we read stories in the Bible and we're like, that had to be made up. That had to be like allegorical because then you just can't see how that could be a real thing. No, this had to be a real story. Otherwise, it just wouldn't be it wouldn't be clear. Uh, it, just one of the reasons why I always give lots of scriptures is so that you guys can write them down. And if you're ever trying to figure out, like, hey, what should I read throughout the week? Just use these as a devotional, as a way to keep on reading. First Kings thirteen verse or First Kings three verse thirteen says this. Now two women who were harlots or prostitutes came to the king. Now, as a kid, when I ever heard the story, it was when two lady, ladies or two women came to the king. They always left that part out. I'm not quite sure why. Maybe they're just trying to like tone it down for me as a kid. But these were two prostitutes who came to the king. They stood before him, and this is what they said. My lord, my lord, my lord. Ah, maybe make it a little bit up. Said this. One of them began, this woman and I live in the same house. I gave birth to a baby while she was with me in the house. Three days later, this woman also had a baby. We were alone. There were only two of us in the house. Here's two prostitutes living together in a house. Is this a brothel? Was this a place where there would be human trafficked? Who knows? But you kind of see the situation that they were dealing with. Or maybe they were kicked out. For some reason, this was the house they went to because they were pregnant. And maybe because they were pregnant, they couldn't do their job anymore. I don't know the whole story, the whole situation. Either way, here they are. Was there more people in the house? It says no. It says this. But her baby died. But we were there all along. There were only two of us. Verse 19, but her baby died during the night when she rolled over on him. Tragic. And when she got up in the night, she took my son from me beside me while I was still sleeping. She laid her dead child in my arms and took mine to sleep beside me. Moms, if you've ever felt exhaustion, you know what this feels like. 
Just the exhausted part about being able to have something happen to you in the middle of the night and not realize it till later because you were so extremely exhausted. And in the morning when I tried to nurse my son, he was dead. But I looked more closely in the morning light. I saw that it wasn't my son at all. Then the other woman interrupted. It certainly was your son and the living child is mine. No, the first woman said the living child is mine and the dead one is yours. So they argued back and forth. So here's two ladies just yelling at each other before the king. The guy's like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Every man in the world would be like, uh, we don't have DNA tests. I have no clue what to do. And he continues. Then the king said, let's get the facts straight. Both of you claim the body, baby that's alive, the living child is yours. And he says the dead one belongs to the other one, right? Right? Yep, yep, yep. Okay. He turns to one of his guards. Hey, can you bring me a sword? Now, here's what I think when I walk through this. Like, I'm thinking in my head, his two guards or the guards, maybe they don't have swords on them. Maybe they do. Maybe they just knew the lady. Hey, you got two ladies coming. They're fighting about a baby. We really don't need to bring our swords. Like, we're not really worried about these two chicks. Like, can you go get me a sword? And they're looking at each other like, we got to go get a sword? You see, dude, this dude just mad, is he this mad at these two moms that he's about to kill? Uh, they just have to do what they're told. It's the king, you just do what you're told. So they bring him a sword. So a sword was brought to the king. Then he said, cut the living child in two. Give half to one woman, half to another. Now we read that and we're like, there is no way that these ladies would have thought that. Because now we read that and you're like, Okay, they're just gonna kill both of them. Like, there's no way they, we think in our minds that this would have been true. But the only way that they would have bought this is if they thought that the king was telling the truth. Because there's it's not a threat if you unless you actually think that it's going to happen. Hey, I'm gonna kill you. No, you're not with all your bare hands. Look at me. <laughs> right? Like, there's not a threat unless you actually think it's true. So these ladies had to think that this was actually going to happen. This was a real threat with a real outcome. Then he said, cut, so cut the living child in two, give half to a woman and half to the other. Then the woman who was the real mother of the living child and who loved him very much said, no, 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 no. Stop, stop, stop. Don't kill him, don't kill him. But the other woman goes, if he can't be mine, you might as well be none of us. Go ahead and kill him. That's essentially what she said. If I can't have him, you can't either. If you're the real mom, you know what you're saying. You don't care. You're going to have compassion. I'd rather see my kids live than not raise them at all. Those are my only two choices. Those are two pretty disastrous choices. But if I can't raise my kids, I'd at least let them be alive than dead. That's what the real mom says. <coughs> Then the king said, don't kill the child, but give it to the woman who wants him to live, for she is the real mother. When all heard, Israel heard the king's decision, the people were in awe of the king, and they saw the wisdom that God had given them for rendering justice. Why? The mom would have so much, the real parent would have so much compassion, she'd rather give up her child than to see it die. That's compassion. That's compassion. Right, as kids, I remember there's times where sometimes we think our parents kind of go overboard with things. <laughs> sometimes they may. Sometimes they might. Absolutely. But it's because they have compassion. Here's what passion really means. It means to lift, or compassion really means this. In this sense, in the wording, when you truly translate it back, it means to live with passion. It means to live with passion. That's what it means. So to me, it just means that she was so full of passion for her kids, for her child, that she didn't care. She'd rather to see it alive than anything else. Passion. Live with passion. If we're going to celebrate moms, one of the best ways to do it is to live with passion. Live with passion. To live all up. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, in one of my sermons, I don't remember when, I just know my parent, my family, and especially my two children, have been making fun of me about it and ripping me, not ripping me apart, but holding me accountable. I call it ripping me apart. They call it holding me accountable. You see how I'm like, right? It can, it can vary a little bit. But I said this line, tomorrow never comes. Right? I said this line, tomorrow never comes. 
Man, it's been used against me. Man, I hate it when my own crap gets used against me. <laughs> it's the worst. It's the worst. But it's true. Okay? It's true. I said it before somebody, I believe, before the person that we were praying for to be healed of cancer wasn't healed, and we had to do their funeral. She left behind two kids. 35 years old, left behind two kids, spent her last three years fighting cancer. So I said it before that. And then Friday, night, our community was robbed of a 13-year-old in Reedsburg getting hit by a car, a truck, waiting for her to get on the bus. Tomorrow never comes, and I don't mean to be that, to be like sick and twisted, and if you know me, I'm not one of these people that's like, we're all gonna die tomorrow, Jesus is coming back. Actually, no, I think there's so many people that think Jesus is coming back that he's like, you're a bunch of idiots, I'm not coming back anytime soon. Like, that's just kind of, that's just how, there's too many people trying to come up with too many solutions, but that's a whole nother discussion, another sermon series for a whole nother day. But the issue is to live with passion, to live with passion today, because tomorrow never comes. Live with passion. Be passionate about what you do. Be passionate about who you do it with. Be passionate about your families. Be passionate. If there's something in a relationship that needs to be fixed, fix it. Don't wait for tomorrow because tomorrow never comes. Do it today. If there's something spiritual that you need to get fixed with Jesus, do it today. Don't wait. I'll do it tomorrow. Right? That, that's what 22-year-olds say who are living ridiculously lives. I'll, I'll start changing how I manage my finances. When? Next week. It never comes. All right, I'll go to class. When? My next class period, I'll do it tomorrow. No, you won't. Do it today. Whatever it is, do it today. Live passionately. Live with passion. This fervor, do it today. Live with passion. No matter what it is, if it's like a mental health, emotional health issue, do it. get help today. Why? Because tomorrow never comes. We're not promised anything. I'm never, trust me, there's nothing I want to be as a Debbie Downer on, on Mother's Day. But if there's something you're like, oh, do it today. I don't care your wording, what I do. I say, I say it's about choosing this over this. Some people are like, well, I have to fake it till I make it. I don't, I don't like it, but if that's what you have to use to do it, do it. I don't have to force myself to do it. Do it. <laughs> whatever, whatever wording you have to do to get yourself to do it, I'm okay with it. I think there's much better words than call faking it or forcing it. But whatever you have to do to get yourself, well, I don't want to go to class. I just have to force myself. Do it. Do it. Do it. I have to force myself to eat healthy. I don't care. Do it. Do it. We're not promised anything. We're not promised anything, right? Uh, moms, you are so passionate about your kids. Right, Jack has this group of friends he goes and hangs out with like once a month or so. Sometimes they tear at Walmart. So if you're there on a Saturday night at night, 10 o'clock at night, and he's there, just smack them. Yeah, feel, feel free to do so. But there's this group of friends. There's eight girls and two boys. I know, I'm kind of proud of them. <laughs> Anyways, but they, they get together and they hang out. But on Saturday nights, when he, goes over to, when he goes over to the friend's house that they all go to, there's always an adult with them bringing them places, okay? We don't just send a bunch of middle schoolers into Walmart by themselves. We're maybe dumb parents once in a while, but we're not nearly that dumb by any stretch of the imagination. There's always an adult with them. But when he goes to this friend's house and he goes over there, sometimes it gets a little later than what we're comfortable with or we're just old and we're tired. So Tina will be like, I'm falling asleep. She's like, here's the deal. We, she won't fall asleep unless I stay up and make sure he's okay. Right? Why? She's passionate and she cares about her kids. It's not like I don't care. She's like, well, he's going to come home. Just a different mentality, different attitude. So she's like, I'm cool falling asleep. But either that or she's not falling asleep. Just one or two things. We'll either stay up and watch TV until 11, 11.30 until he, he gets his butt home when it's too late to come home. Or she's like, I'm knocking out and you're staying up. I'm like, all right, I'll go watch a movie. You can fall asleep. Why? She's passionate about our kids. Because moms are passionate about their kids. Where did they get this passion? Where did they get this compassion from? Jesus. Matthew 9, 35 and 37 says, But when he, Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. I love this because you can almost say for this, it's like children without a mother. It's like children without a father. 
Do you see kids in our society running loose? They're like sheep without a shepherd and they don't have parents at home. Our number one issue in society is simply that. It's childless homes. It, or it's parentless homes. That's what it is. It's kids without parents. They may have adults in the home, but they don't have parents in the home. They may have an adult, but they don't have a parent. You can be an adult and call a parent or a guardian on paper, but that doesn't mean you're being a parent in her life. Those are two different things. It's a lot easier to be an adult than being a parent. I like being an adult to my kids. Those are fun times. I don't like being a parent all the time. Those are two different things. Those are two different things. The passion and compassion that moms get is from God. Because uh, uh, one of the things that you have to realize when we read about the traits and the qualities that Jesus possesses or that God wants us to have, it means he has them. So one of the blessed, best things that you can do is read through the Beatitudes. It's like the first sermon that Jesus preached. It's Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And also the blessed statements. I've actually done like a sermon series on it probably way back. I don't know if you can find it. But like, blessed are the meek and blessed are the humble. And you can watch, see all these things. And you can see how God is already responding to us through how he wants us to respond to others. Because if he says these are the traits and qualities you need to have, he has those traits and qualities himself. All right, because he's never going to ask you to have something if he doesn't already have it. So if you're like, man, what are the traits and qualities of God? Just look and find the things that he wants you to have. He has those already. Those are the traits and qualities that he has. So when it says rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, you go, God rejoices with us when we rejoice and he's weeping with us when we weep. It's how we know, and we saw it played out an example a couple weeks ago when it says that Jesus wept. It wasn't that he was weeping that the person died. It's that he was weeping with the person who was weeping. He was carrying their burdens with them. He was having compassion with them. So we see it played out in the life. It's not just a hypothetical thing. So when you're stressed and you're burdened by all the weight that you're carrying, remember, don't ever let Satan tell you that God doesn't care because God cares because his, your care comes from his care. So the only way that you feel so weighted and the burden and the stress of caring too much is because God cares that much about you. That's where the care comes from. Because the lie that the enemy always wants to tell is one of the lies this is like a guy never knows. Well, God doesn't even know what he's going, we're going through. If he knew what we were going through, if he knew what we were dealing with, it wouldn't have happened in the first place. It's not true. God's there with us every step along the way. God knows and God cares. God knows and God cares. Isaiah 66, 13 says, God says, As one who his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you shall be comforted. Just like a mom comforts, that's how God comforts us. I think sometimes what happens is then we see God through the same light as our parents. We see God through the light that we see the light of our parents. But God's infallible, God's perfect. Our parents were far from it. So we, sometimes we read these kind of type of scriptures and we're like, yeah, but I was never comforted by my mom, so God's never going to comfort me. No, he's a perfect parent. He comforts. He always comforts. God knows, God cares. Why? Because God is intuitive and God is compassionate. That's how we know. That's how we know he knows and that's how we know he cares because you're intuitive, comforting, and compassionate. The third one is this. Mothers are nurturing. Moms are nurturing. And isn't it amazing to see the difference between boys and girls? And it's hilarious to watch this thing play out in real life. And we were done with the whole little kid stage. This whole thing is throwing me for a loop. Right? I was used to like boys being dirty and smelling. They still are. It's gross. But every time they leave the house and they come back inside, you're like, oh, what happened? Right? Every time. And we went out to get snakes the other day. Rick, Rick took us out to get snakes. So we were playing this thing to get snakes and everything else. And, we had the windows rolled down driving back and the boys wanted to roll the windows up and as soon as they did, 
Oh, I was like, what is that? Roll the window back down. I had Calvin and Owen with me, right? I'm just like, oh, boom. <laughs> Straight to the shower. It's like, it doesn't, it's just, it's like, how? I don't smell that bad. I'm a grown adult. Like, how does this happen? Right, it's just, it's like, or, or they come out, they come inside, they run straight downstairs, and you walk downstairs, and it's just this, or, and it's like a cartoon, right? Remember the old cartoons? But then the green smoke, the green cloud of smoky smell, and you're like, that's what it smells like. And you walk downstairs, and we're just like, oh, I think it was Calvin's birthday couple, we'd see a bunch of friends over, dude, and it's just, or just a couple of friends from school, and they walk downstairs, and I'm like, oh, boys. Right? It was just like this, oh, this aroma, boys are different. Girls. And they don't notice it at all. And they don't notice it. They don't care. They're like, hey, you're four weeks without showering. You're just like, dude, you're literally going to kill the people who sit next to you in class. Like, they will literally fall over and die if you don't do something, right? Like, the rest of your class is going to have to have a substitute teacher just for you because you killed your teacher and your entire class. Well, you sat there and had no idea it was taking place. And then girls, girls on their other hand are completely different. Jane has 38 dolls, sets them up, plays house with everyone. It doesn't matter if it's Peppa Pig or this doll or this doll or this doll. All right, in fact, for her birthday, she wants a whole Barbie set. But a Barbie set has to be mom, a dad, three brothers, and a sister. Because she thinks that's what families are because that's her family. That's what she wants. In the house with the pool, like this is just what she wants. Girls are different, man. I took Jane, Tina took the two kids shopping yesterday, which is just a disaster. But she went to Madison, so I had all day. And so I had Jane and Calvin. Jack Owen was at a birthday party, so I had Jane and Calvin. I was like, this will be great. Calvin went, went out to the park, and here I am with Jane. She was in a frozen dress, Crocs, and had her baby with her. She's like, let's go to the park. And I'm like, all right. She didn't want me to play with her. She just wanted to play with the baby. So she's pushing the baby on the swing. She's pushing it down the slide. She's doing all the stuff. And she had to go play in the sand, pretend it was the beach. And she's digging this, like she buried her baby like four different times in the sand. And she's doing all these things. Why? It's just, she's a girl. Like in a frozen dress, it's a little big. It's sort of like, you know, it's just, it's hilarious. Girls are different than boys. Girls are just different than boys. They're just automatically nurturing. They're just the way it is. So it's different. We're trying to raise girls to be soft and tender and gentle. Boys are trying to raise them to be strong and tough and protective and determined, yet soft too, but strong at the same time because it's a really weird like society that they're growing up in and they're trying to like confuse genders on kids and it's just there's so many things that are just taking place and so you're trying to balance all of this. And it's hard sometimes. To be nurturing because we're growing like here's here's how I think of nurturing. Um, you got plants, anybody got like indoor plants? And you break it, it falls, and it's like then you pick it back up and it's a bloop, <laughs> and it just falls, right? In order to keep that plant like upright again, you have to get a little stick, you get a little twisty tie, and it like keeps it sturdy so that it can continue to grow back strong. It's wounded. We're walking wounded. Nurturing means you got to care for that plant to keep it to growing. The hard part is that as adults, we're wounded and trying to take care of our wounded kids. A lot of times we're doing, trying to do it without Jesus. The only way that we can be whole and get healthy is Jesus has to prop us up. Jesus has to prop us up. The only way our kids can be fully healthy is with the help of Jesus propping them up. They're wounded. I get it, because life stinks. Life's hard. Rules have changed. I don't know if you guys realize this. Rules have changed. Right? Jack comes home every time. Sorry, Jack. I'm throwing you under the bus a lot. And I, this is last week was Teacher Appreciation Week, and I love teachers. I think teachers are, are, are underpaid, overworked. They deal with so much junk and so much stress. It is unbelievable. I love teachers. I love the elementary school that our kids go to. It was absolutely amazing because the the lady who, who died a couple weeks ago, her kids go to the same elementary school that I we went to. So when we had the visitation, the whole school showed up. It was awesome. 
You see a whining teacher walking in with the receptionist. Pay their respects and they say hi. And it's like, this is so cool to see all these kids. Our kids, they're here, they're here, they're here, they're here. They're here. It's, just, it's so awesome to see the camaraderie within the school. So I love teachers. But Jack comes home from school, all of them. He goes, I hate this, this is so stupid. He's like, girls can say anything they want to us as guys, and they can get away with anything. They can smack us around, and they can do this, they can do this, but we stick up for ourselves. One day we're going to get kicked out of the class. Like, yeah, welcome to the real world, buddy. It sucks. Right? So, one, you're raising your daughter daughters to not do that, but you're raising your son to have so much extra self control and to be, you know what I mean? And to try to not respond in ways to get himself in trouble, but yet not to be a walking doormat. Nurturing. While you have your own feelings and wounds and emotions about everything going on, right? Like, that nurturing, the only way we can do it is from Jesus. To all the complex situations that we deal with, the only way to do it is with the help of Jesus. Moms are nurturing. And Matthew 12 actually starts at verse 20. It's actually an example, I won't read it, you can just write it down, of a bruised reed. And it shows us and walks it through it. Moms are intuitive. Because God is God knows. God knows. Moms are compassionate because God cares. The third thing is moms are nurturing because God wants to help you. Just like moms nurture, moms help, and moms care. And they're always there. Kids get sick, moms there. Right? Last week, Jade's throwing up in the middle of the night. All I hear the moms are, Gary, get down here. Oh, she had her strip, got to get the price. Like, all night long. She threw up like 12 times. Mom's there. Nurturing. Caring. Why? Because moms are nurturing. You're nurturing. The same way you want to help your kids, the same way God wants to help you. The same way that God wants to help you. Can I encourage you to take it? Like, take it. Taking help doesn't make you weak. It makes you human. It makes you alive. But taking help never makes you weak. We kind of think that. Especially guys and us men, we kind of tend to think that needing help makes us weak. It doesn't. It doesn't. He loves you. And he knows what you're going through. And he cares. And he wants to be there. And he wants to help. He's nurturing. That's where you get your nurturing, caring about. I think a lot of times we go, oh, we're going to go through something. God's just trying to teach me something. Or oh, God's making us go through that. No. Life just happens. And he wants to help walk us through the hard times in life. Here's a really awesome theological like explanation is you have tires right tires are made out of rubber inside tires are air right does that make sense okay if your tire runs over a nail that nail pierces the rubber tire and air comes out of it right that's not god or the devil that's just natural thing. That's just what happens does that make sense right if you run over a nail with your tire your tire is going to go flat but what happens is when natural things happen because of decisions that we make, we're like, oh, God's caused me to have something happen. No, it's just life. Oh, the devil's attacking me again. No, he's not. That's just called life. So stop over-spiritualizing things. That's just called life. No, he's there to get us through life. That's what Jesus is there to do. But life's going to happen. Good things and bad things are going to happen in life. It's going to happen. He's there to help us get through it. It's not blameless in things. He's there to nurture us and get us through it. Why? Because God knows. And God cares. And he wants to help. And not just help, but help now. I think a lot of times that, that impacts things. Because we're like, well, God wants to help. Okay, but when? Now. Tomorrow never comes. He wants to help now. Not next week. Not tomorrow, because today's Mother's Day. We're supposed to be fun. We're not just supposed to deal with any kind of life stuff on Mother's Day because we're just going to push it all aside, eat some sweets, take an afternoon nap, and go on with our life, and we'll pick up tomorrow. No, God wants to help now. You're too important to let things go. Your relationships are too important to let things go. You're too important to let things go. No matter what it is, deal with it. Deal with it now. Can God teach you something through a flat tire and all this stuff? Yeah, but he's not causing it. It's just life, and he will use to help you. He will use it to help you. Because where did you go when you were five years old riding a bike? Where'd you go? 
Your mom. Skin to knee, means your mom. Fathers are nurturing. Where did, where did moms get that from? The nurturing ability from? Jesus. So your take home is simply this. Run to the one who created moms. And do it now. Don't do it later. Don't do it tomorrow. Run to the one who created moms. Run to the nurturing. He wants to help. Right? Here's, here's how he's going to help. He's going to help us be who we are, not what we want to be. He's going to help us be who, not what. We want to deal with the what and then the who first. Right? We want what to happen, and then we'll deal with the who. God's like, no, I deal with the who, and then the what comes after that. Because our goals, our dreams, our American version of things, we go, this is what we want to take place. So we concentrate on the what. Retirement, houses, businesses, whatever, what, losing weight, whatever what is, we deal with the what, then we want to deal with the who. God's like, no, 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 I want to work with the who, and then the what follows. So if it's at work, it's not my boss who needs to do this, it's we who need to do it, it's not the kids who need to change, it's we need to change, right? Whatever it is, let's not pass the buck to something else, it's who, let's always work on us. Always work on us, right? I tell students this all the time, don't blame, it's not your teacher. No, 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 not your teacher. How, what can you do in this situation? I want to say teacher, that's the easy route for my kids, right? All oh, my kids are perfect, so it's the teacher's fault. Because I'm a normal dad. But what if it's not the teacher's fault? What if it's not your boss's fault? What if we're just not that great of a boy? What if it's not your boss's fault? What if it's yours? What if it's your kids that really don't cause them the stress and chaos in your life? It's just you. Deal with you. Deal with who? And it's not that other things don't have other faults. Your boss could be a pathetic boss, but there's always something you can do. So it's not passing. It's not trying to say that those situations aren't real. It's not to say that your spouse isn't perfect because they're not, because there is no perfection. It's not an actual attainable thing. Right, your kids aren't perfect, and you're not a perfect parent, and they're not perfect siblings, and none of this stuff is. So it's not to say the situation, you go, yeah, what about this? Yep, that's still there. Absolutely. But God's always going to deal with the who before the what comes. Always. Always. Focus on being who you need to be first. Because God knows, God cares, and God wants to help, and he wants to help now. So run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. Moms, you will run into a burning building for your kids. Will you do it for yourself? Do it for you. Do it for you. Whatever that looks like. Dads, do it for you. You'll sacrifice and sacrifice and sacrifice and sacrifice, and you'll wear the same shirt for 15 years. So your kids can always have new clothes on, right? So will you do it for you? Will you run to Jesus? You don't need a church to run to Jesus. This is just a, this is just concrete walls with a sign out for outside. That's all this is. Run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. He's there. He knows. He cares. And he wants to help now. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for our moms on this Mother's Day. We thank you for all the moms and all the ladies here who are set an amazing example for us of God's character. Because that's all we are. We are always a reflection of your character. So we thank you for moms and we thank you for your character, Lord, to show us that we can be intuitive. Show us that you know what we're going through. And that's a good thing that you know. And that you care. That you just don't want to help, but you want to help Help us to leave knowing that. And help us to run to you. Give us the courage to run to you. Because we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Because tomorrow never comes. And I'm not trying to be sick or twisted or <coughs> angry. But Lord, we're not guaranteed anything. But Lord, we are guaranteed that you will come and help us whenever we call out. And that's what gives us the courage to do that and do that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless. Have a great week. Don't forget you ladies to grab your coloring book, and your coffee bean gift card. Have a great one, guys.